Breaking Free, How to Stop Gambling is a workbook and it is absolutely easy to follow. It is broken down in different chapters, just in the way that our sessions at the clinic focus on different things that one can do. The tracking of one's behaviour is vital to this cognitive behavioural intervention. What I mean by that is that we, you can use an app if you want, the gambling apps uh, that track your, your behaviours, but we very much encourage people to use a grid, you know, paper, square paper, and if you have gambled on any day, um, you have a flat line along the little square, but if you have managed to remain abstinent, you have a di di diagonal line going up. So you're climbing that mountain of getting away from the illness. It's a sort of visual illustration of the wonderful work of abstinence that you have achieved. And our patients love this. So tracking on paper is still something we know works very well. But some, the next chapter is very much about how do you know you have a problem? People always say, well, I do love gambling. I've gambled all, all my life. I know I've got, a, I, I've got debts, but how do I know it's really a problem? And that's when uh, we, I've, I've spoken about this earlier in this interview, but really, have you lied to others and have you bet more than you can afford to lose are the two fundamental issues. But of course, you should look at debts, you should look at percentage of income, of your spending on gambling, emotional distance from spouse, from children. Some people totally uh, realise they've neglected their children growing up for years because they've spent all their time pretending to be working on their laptops when they're actually gambling. And of course the neglecting of work ends up with people often losing, losing their jobs. So in the book we have uh, uh, ways of you understanding the severity, for example, of your presentation and your experiences with gambling and the problem gambling severity index is one of the ways that we look at whether you are a non-problem gambler or low risk gambler or moderate or severe risk and it depends on various schools. Uh, I've gone through the majority of the criteria just now so so I won't I won't go through that again. Normally we look at things that have happened in the last year rather than just the last week or the last few weeks because sometimes people do, people do things intensely for a few weeks but it doesn't mean you've got an illness and you've got to be treated. So it's important to look at a span of time and clinically speaking normally it's a year that people look back on to say what symptoms they're experiencing and how severe they are. Uh, another chapter is about increasing motivation to stop and the drive to change one's habits, which changes every day, and how to really embark on treatment and not drop out. And we use decisional balance sheet, sheets with pros and cons of change. And uh, what do I like about gambling? What do I dislike about gambling? What do I dislike about not gambling? And what do I like about not gambling? We, we move on to chapters about plans of change, about one's goals and how important it is right now to stop gambling and what gives me the confidence uh, to be able to say that I can stop. For example, past periods of abstinence you can rely on to give you an idea that you're capable of do it again, doing it again. Uh, there's a bits about confidence, how to build your confidence around changing your, your life. And um, we talk about cue cards, uh, I've mentioned a bit about this, but an example from the book would be, if I gamble, I will lose my partner, my debts will never end, I will lose my job. If I stop gambling, I will have money to do things I like. For example, go on holiday. For example, buy Christmas presents. These are classic examples our patients give us. I will feel less stressed. I will feel better mentally. My children will have a better life. So um, I've talked about stimulus control, that's in the book. Uh, I've talked about reducing access to money. Um, I need to mention the reward schedule. This is really important in terms of the uh, effectiveness of treatment. We encourage people uh, to choose rewards because these reinforce the behavior of not gambling. Patients feel really guilty. They don't like the idea of rewarding themselves. They feel they must stop gambling full stop. Uh, but actually, if they can start not to gamble and they can use a little bit of that money 
to maybe have a meal out if they haven't gambled for a week or see a film or treat themselves to something small. Um, that always, always is at the core of the CBT Behavioural Addictions module. It could be a walk at lunchtime, a sweet treat, it could be favourite food, it, it, but it is a contract with yourself. And after a month, that reward gets a bit higher because, of course, you've done well and you haven't spent money on gambling. So there's uh, bits about reflecting on obstacles to a reward schedule, that's very important. There's a section on cravings and urges, um, and the excitement that can lead to plannings when relapse, and how cravings can also appear as gambling-related thoughts. The most important thing about cravings is to stay with the moment, surfing that craving wave. Uh, if you surf that wave, eventually it will lower the impetus, and eventually you will be able to overcome the craving. And remember, these patients are impulsive, they're not good at delayed gratification, so we give them the skills to learn how to be better at delaying gratification. Uh, examples of gambling triggers so people can understand and personalise their own triggers. Uh, we have examples of what to do uh, when you're not gambling, because many people have gambled for, for 20 years, they don't know what to do if they're not gambling. And then... Um, thoughts that one must be aware of, challenging gambling thinking and beliefs, and how to get back on track after a lapse. I suppose one of the good ways of ending uh, this overview of the book is to say all addictions are to be seen as journeys. Sometimes people give in to their addiction, but it's important not to give up completely if you momentarily have a lapse and that's one of the things we really have to focus on how to teach patients that going to the bookmakers once for 10 minutes is not having to give up on everything it's a bit like people who have been on a diet for a month they have a slice of cake this isn't a reason to give everything up and eat 10 cakes it's actually to see it as a lapse and carry on with the good work you've been doing so a lot of it is motivational so I think I've given you, hopefully, a very detailed overview of what this book is about.